Hey there, restaurant pros. It's Dave Scott Peters, and welcome to episode 66 of the Restaurant Prosperity Formula. I've been coaching restaurant owners since 2003, and the Restaurant Prosperity Formula is based on what the most successful restaurant owners I've worked with do on a daily basis to achieve their success. The basic premise of the formula centers around achieving prosperity, freedom for your restaurant, and the financial freedom you deserve. To achieve prosperity, you have to follow a very specific formula made up of leadership, systems, training, accountability, and taking action. Now, I want to tell you about our guest today, John Dempster. John opened his first restaurant, The Shanty, in the rural seaside community of Cape Charles, Virginia. Prior to opening the restaurant, he spent 15 years traveling the country, working his way up in the hospitality from the dish pit in coastal New England towns to general manager of an independent Italian restaurant in Los Angeles with a really, really awesome noodle stop in Seattle along the way. His passion for the industry maintains his drive to continue learning and growing on a daily basis with an emphasis on creating the best culture for his team and community. He now has a second location, Dead Rise Italian Kitchen, in the same town, and most importantly, a wonderful family that makes all the hard work and the hard days worth it. Listen in on our conversation as John shares with you what took him from somebody who already had many of the systems in place, including budgets and recipe costing cards, to someone who also now understood the why. And by using the why, was able to use that to explode his profitability and time working strategically on his business. I want to welcome John Dempster to the show today. But first, a word from our sponsor. We all know managing costs is one of the most important parts of running a profitable restaurant, especially now. But between fluctuating vendor prices, waste, labor, and the never-ending list of tasks that demand your attention on a daily basis, it can be challenging for even the most experienced of us to manage costs well. That's where Margin Edge comes in. Margin Edge is a complete restaurant management software that automatically uses data from your POS and invoices to show you food and labor costs in real time. Don't wait until it's too late. Margin Edge gives you tools to make decisions in the moment, like a daily P&L, price alerts on key ingredients, and real-time plate costs, all without ever having to touch a spreadsheet. Take control of your costs, work more efficiently, and be more profitable. Go to www.marginedge.com forward slash DSP to learn more and schedule your demo today. John, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. Happy to. Thanks for being, thanks for having me. Well, what I wanted you to do right now is kind of tell everybody a little bit about your background and your restaurants you have today. Well, so um, I'll break it up. So my background is uh, I'm originally from New England, Massachusetts, uh, coastal seaside town, Rockport, Gloucester is kind of where I grew up. And then I've been working in restaurants since I was 14 years old, um, really kind of all I've ever known. Started off, you know, as a bus boy and dishwasher and moved up to server and bartender. Uh, moved all over the country working in different independently owned restaurants. Was out in Seattle for a while, uh, working in kind of an Asian Loatian concept, and then back to Boston, doing everything from kind of neighborhood bars to you know uh, fine dining wine bars. Then out to Los Angeles for a while, where I was in an Italian place for a bit. Um, back to Boston, and then eventually ended up here in Virginia, where I'm at now in Cape Charles, which is a small rural community on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we opened our first restaurant 10 years ago. It's called The Shanty, and it's a waterfront seafood dining place that um, I would say has changed a little bit since the initial concept in the sense that we thought we were opening kind of a New England fried clam shack joint, and that evolved two weeks before we opened into a full-service dining um, waterfront restaurant. <clears throat> so... And that restaurant now is, um, you know, doing about $3.1 million a year in annual revenue, has about 120 seats and a staff in season of 75 to 80 and out of season, you know, about half of that. It's a very seasonal area, beach town. So we deal with a lot of challenges in terms of peaks and valleys. And what I often tell people, we're kind of running at least two different restaurants, if not three, based on the challenges of the revenue stream. Um, and then additionally, we opened a small Italian pizzeria six years ago in the same town um, that does a little bit less than half of the revenues, but it's a really terrific place and is actually a little bit more consistent year round. Um, and just both places I'm very proud of and very happy to be involved with and I think have had a big impact on the community and, um, you know, we're doing well. Well, it, it's pretty impressive. I mean, you know, we all 
I shouldn't say we all. Many of us who are lifers in the restaurant business start from that dishwasher position, work their way up and what have you. But, you know, just the, the fact that all the sheer geography that you've covered, which means you've you've seen a lot of different things from cuisine to temperaments in the kitchen to how people run minimum wages and so on. So it's really a breadth of experience. And it's pretty interesting because you took all of that to open up your own place and now places. With that said, you had all this experience. What was like? What was life like before we met? Like what was going on that, that even had you say, Hey, I need to find something else. Cause you have an incredible amount of experience and lots of good stuff. Yeah. I mean, well, there's, there's a million reasons why the program was the right program for us. Um, you know, and I would say for us, you know, my, my I opened the restaurant with, with my best friend, my business partner, Mike, we both had a very similar background. Both came from the same town. We've been friends since we were, you know, young and in high school, um, you know, I think a lot of we brought a lot of experience to the table, but we brought a lot of what I would call maybe uh, traditional experience to the table that, you know, food cost should be 34% because that's industry standard, you know, but right. should it really be 34%? I don't know. <laughs> you know. So it was just kind of a, we had some mythological numbers, I would say in our head that we were trying to operate our business under these mythological numbers that we thought applied and made sense for our operations. Um, but in the course of working with you, we've been able to drill down the reasons for why those numbers should be what they should be and what the numbers have to be to make the business make sense for, um, you know, the various reasons that you're in business, which there's a lot of variables there too. And to some degree, uh, what certain people are looking for out of their business is different than what other people are looking for. And that can have a lot to do with the makeup of the company. Right. So you and your partner started the businesses, but there was a change, a major change that was happening. It kind of pushed you into, hey, I've got to find something else, or I should say shore up some of your numbers side of things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So Mike and I, I mean, we're still very close, but you know, Mike um, moved down here from Boston to help me open the restaurant in 2012. Um, since then, you know, my life changed a lot in the sense that my mother moved down here. My sister moved down here. I'm now married with an eight year old son. Um, this has really become home for me. And that same transition didn't necessarily happen for Mike. So he decided that he really needed to be, you know, back up closer to his family. And with that transition happening, we needed something that was a little bit of support for the business and for myself. Um, uh, because Mike and I have kind of really always operated as a little bit of a left brain, right brain tandem where I've. You know, not that Mike's not creative, but I certainly can't stand a lot of the things that Mike handled. And we each brought a lot of things to the table for each other. Um, so and that was a big part of the reason why the business has been as successful as it's been. Uh, but we were missing a component there of getting down to the understanding of the whys, which is one of the things that led us to you. And also with Mike leaving, I needed to make sure that I was learning and having the support, you know, from a system standpoint. Um, to remain successful without him being here doing all the things that he had been used to doing that I, you know, just just gotten used to him doing. Right. So he was the numbers guy. You were the the experienced guy for lack of lack of a, 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 a all the details. But the truth of the matter is, he made sure he looked at the numbers. You made sure the guest experience was the best. That's an accurate kind of summary. Yeah, I, I mean, I enjoy looking at the numbers. I enjoy the analytical part of the business, but I don't, I don't necessarily like the mechanisms of sitting down with a spreadsheet for hours at a time and making formulas work and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm always kind of chasing a shiny object and thinking, oh, well, maybe we could put this on the menu or maybe we should think about this, you know, operational procedure. But, you know, Mike really enjoyed and, and really excels at being into the data and making sure that the data is speaking to itself and that you know, it's being analyzed properly. Um, and those are things that I kind of like to skim, <laughs> quite frankly, you know, um, not the most fun part of the business for me. So, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, um, it was the right timing for us to take on a program like this that has uh, given me a better understanding of those systems and put some different systems in place that we didn't have before that are similar to some things that we were already thinking about, but give us a better understanding of them and give us a better opportunity to really dive into them. And, and actually, I mean, I guess the most important thing is to stay ahead of them, as opposed to, I would say, prior to being involved with the program, we were more reactive as opposed to being proactive. And now we have a better strategy for being proactive and saying, okay, well, this is, you know, how we're going to budget for these things that we expect to come down the road, as opposed to 
all right, things have been a little bit different in the last few weeks. We need to, you know, find a way to chew up the food costs again or whatever, labor costs, things of that nature. Just just to touch on that real quick, because, you know, you're, again, drinking from the Kool-Aid, the proactive versus reactive, all those things. But the key thing that, that jumped out at me is you just said budget, because when we met, you had a budget. You had a budget tool of some sorts. What was the major difference between your old budget and the way you budget now after going through the program? Well, again, this goes into the whys of what the numbers should be, right? So when we had a budget in the past, our budget was based off historical data. So it was, you know, we have a budget for 2023 coming up, and we would do that budget, you know, in November, December, begin working on it, put it together for the year. And it would be based on, let's say, last year, our food costs ran at 37, 38, 39 percent. And we would say to each other, well, do we think it's realistic to get it down two points by potentially changing this or that in the kitchen or maybe changing a menu item? And let's say labor costs were 36 percent last year. Could we potentially bring it down two points by doing X, Y or Z? But there was no real, you know, there wasn't necessarily a, a fleshed out strategy of why the food costs were 39 percent or why the labor costs were 36 percent until you know when we began with you and, and as you know we dived right in immediately we began with you in april of 22 sorry i'm getting confused now that we're in 23 yeah it's april of 22 and for us it was basically a month before season really kicks off right and so in our discovery call with you and we expressed to you that our food costs were too high and you said listen we're going to jump right into menu engineering right and so we did that and that was i mean that was a game changer for us last year we shaved eight points off food costs in the first season um, based on having the strategy that we dialed in with you on the menu engineering, putting all our recipe costing cards together, putting them all into the spreadsheet, using the product mix and saying, well, you know, your ideal food cost really, you know, should be right now based on what you guys are doing, 31. So you should be running 34. But if we make this change and this change, we can get it down to 28. And you should be running at 31. And once we realized, you know, the strategy to get there and, and had the understanding of how to get there, uh, we were able to really affect change and make a tremendous financial impact. Um, you know, and the same can be said for labor costs by going through, you know, the labor hours worked and, and the meals produced per hour in the kitchen. And, you know, a lot of those things that we talked about in going through the budget and trying to figure out strategies to, you know, stagger start times, stagger finish times, um, trying to figure out peak hours and not just blanketing, you know, service with what you think you need for your busiest few hours, but making sure that you're covered when you need it, while also not just spending it for creep labor. Um, you know, when we were able to affect those changes and make a budget that was based on not a what if, but now we know that this is how we get there. So let's create a budget that is based on how we get there and what we need to do to get there. Um, and implementing that strategy over, you know, the period of, of time that we did made a tremendous impact. And I'm actually, you know, really even looking forward even more to this year because we have a full season under our belts now working with you. And we have, you know, an even better understanding and better systems in place than we did almost a year ago. And so, you know, our budget for this year is even on paper, even better. <laughs> now so it's about making sure that we follow through and stay consistent with the systems. Well, I think it's amazing. And I want people to understand that when we met you and Mike, you were already systems people because we couldn't have done the menu engineering call if you didn't already have recipe costing cards. So you're right. already, you know, that puts you in, in the top tier of people who are operating independent restaurants and knowing their numbers and having systems and needing people. With that said, it's amazing that you can still, with all that experience and with all the right numbers, what a difference it is as you talk about the why. Why do I track this number? Because often we do things like waste sheets and key item trackers, things like that, just because we've done it in the past. We've worked in the kitchen before, worked in a restaurant before it was done, and we just do it. But what the hell do we do with it? And then how does it impact going forward? And I think that's the biggest thing. For you guys, it was a lot easier than many people going on the journey because you had system, system, systems, kind of like a bunch of gears that were really important, but none of them worked together. You just needed that right. small little gear that all of a sudden tied it all together. And it was like, bang, results were amazing. And so I want people to understand that, you know, not everybody can have the kind of results you have right out of the gate unless you already have numbers. But the beautiful part is everybody, as I think you can say, going through the program, everybody has an opportunity to get to the same spot you are now, it's just a different journey. Does that sound accurate? Absolutely. I mean, you you know, you think about, I talk to people about this all the time, right? So in the early days when I was looking for business partners, you know, the typical reaction you get from people is like invest in a restaurant, you must be out of your mind, right? Six out of 10 restaurants fail. Nobody makes it, blah, 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 blah. That's true. There is, there is not 
you know, as high a success rate in this industry as maybe there are in some others. But what I try to explain to people is that almost anybody can enter into this industry at almost any level of the game. In other words, you're not going to call me to represent you in court for a dispute, right? You're not going to call me to operate on you for an ACL tear. You'd be insane to ask me to do that. However, if you have enough money, you can go open a restaurant with zero experience. Right. So, you know, everybody is at a much different point in the restaurant industry. There's a lot of people who have a lot of different levels of experience. Um, but, you know, the things that make the people successful in the industry really all come down to a lot of the similar things that, that are learnable and teachable and getting those systems in place is the number one step. And we had, like you said, we had a lot of those systems internally, um, but they were based on really some kind of archaic uh, thought process of the industry, meaning, you know, I started out in 1994. So, you know, using an Excel spreadsheet for one thing, and then you have a different Excel spreadsheet for another, they don't talk to each other, they don't necessarily tie into a budget. And in this day and age, you know, there is, you know, as we talk about a lot, there's so much tech opportunity, right. um, almost overwhelmingly so, you know, but once you figure out how to put the pieces together and you realize that, hey, I do this one so that it can affect this one. And if I use these things in succession, then, you know, you have the building blocks for, for a strategy or a game plan that can make you successful. So let's talk about the per, the people side of things for a second. And that is, you were a doer. Uh, like many of us who've grown up in this business, we often flexed our, 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 our culinary prowess, if you will, our, our hospitality prowess by working lots of hours and being God's gift to our business, doing all the things as much as we can. Talk yep. about the change for you, your journey from switching from being the guy to do everything to now you have an implementer, somebody on your team who is going to grow with you and quite honestly is helping all the other managers do better. Yeah, I mean, that that journey started actually before we signed on with you, before before we'd met. Um, you know, that journey for, for us, for Mike and I really started probably about five or six years ago when we were getting to a point where we were still pulling 12, 14 hour days, six days a week, going in on your day off. Um, you know, a lot of that was, you know, my wife and I having our first child, but it was, you know, got to a point where I was leaving in the morning before anybody was up, getting home at night, everybody was in bed. And it just dawned on us that this isn't a, a terrific, sustainable way of life, you know? Right. <clears throat> so we made it, we made a conscious effort to begin hiring more management. And at first it was, you know, a little bit daunting. You felt like, well, financially, this is going to be a significant impact to us personally uh, to have these managers on. But then we found actually that we were able to grow our business in, in some ways, you know, prior to the program, just by having these managers in place, giving up a little bit of control. What we weren't terrific at prior to the program was we had these managers, but we didn't have terrific protocols for accountability with them. Um, we didn't have terrific ways of coaching them and helping them improve. And that's really where, you know, when you speak to the implementer and bringing Adam on board to implement what we went through with the program, um, you know, it's given me an opportunity, I think, as an operator to become a much better operator because instead of you know, maybe going in one day and being frustrated that they may not see something that I see every time I walk in and goes off like an alarm in my head, whether it's even a, a dimmer switch not being set properly or a music level or the wrong station or, you know, hot food, hot, cold food, cold. It's, you know, things like that that used to drive me insane. And I used to get frustrated that they didn't see it. You know, how they don't see it like I see it. And a lot of times they're not going to, right? Because they're not the one signing the check and it's just a different ball game when you're the one signing the check. Right. Um, but through the program, we've been able to create things, you know, whether it was with the jolt list and, you know, leadership style and some self-awareness, um, a better way of coaching our managers. And that's really kind of what my job has transitioned to is less boots on the ground, less scheduled hourly labor, more, you know, how can I help you be, um, you know, how can I help you make sure that you're as successful as you want to be in here and provide a path and an opportunity to continue to grow with the company? while also making sure that that learning is affecting the company in real time and improving our day-to-day -day operations. So then other than when you had a, a loss of a, a transition with a chef, brought somebody in, didn't work out, jumping back into the kitchen, replacing that person, what's life like when you're fully staffed again? Are you in there every single day running shifts or are you working strategically on your business? Uh, it's, uh, well, I'm not running shifts anymore. I mean, I, I, based on just being in a small rural community, I happen to be in the restaurant, you know, pretty much every day, but I live a mile and a half away from each location. So 
Um, and there's not a whole lot to do in our town. <laughs> so, you know, but being in is more of a choice these days than it is a requirement as far as being in the building. I still think it's really important to be in the building. I think it's important for, you know, to be giving positive affirmation to the team. I think it's important to be in there, put eyes on things yourself. But if I don't go in, it's not like my expectations of the day to day are any different from what I expect the team to be able to do on a day to day basis in terms of quality and consistency and service. Um, I do spend a lot more time. I mean, I'm in my home office now. I spend a lot more time at home uh, working on strategy and trying to figure out the best way to implement the best procedures. Um, and instead of kind of, you know, waiting for issues these days to come up and then trying to solve them based on just straight boots on the ground experience. I'm more spending more time trying to forecast what could potentially become an issue to create systems that are in place for, okay, well, this is the button we press here when this happens and everybody knows where it is and everybody knows how to pull the trigger. So this is, this is already in play. You know, whether that's a lot of people in the group have talked about limited menus when you're short staffed, you have to shut down a section. So you kind of have your nuclear menu, right? And things about, for me, I'm thinking a lot more about redundant systems these days, whether that's an equipment system or things of that nature that, you know, what's my worst case scenario? It's 4th of July weekend, the steamer goes down. Do we have a backup plan in place for that? As opposed to years ago, just get the phone call that the steamer's down on 4th of July and everybody pulls their hair out and says, oh, what do we do? You know, so these days I'm trying to think a little bit more about um, the what ifs and, you know, um, making sure that we have strategies in place for all of the, what I call, you know, nuclear possibilities that are certain to come up throughout the course of a season. Well, I, I love the fact that, again working on the business side in it you can show up every single day but you're not required to be there so much so that in the height of your season middle of just balls of the wall busy we've got our group coaching calls and there you are on your boat of participating yep. in our two-hour group coaching call like would that have happened in the past no it's taken years to get there um but the systems you know the systems and the and the group has really helped us get there in a way that and while maybe it may have happened in the past, I would have always had a feeling in the back of my head that I was making a mistake, that I should not right. be on the boat, you right. know? Yep. Nowadays, I have the confidence to be on the boat and say, hey, you know, it's not a big deal for me to take two hours and go fishing, you know? It's it's nice. It brings joy to me when it, when I saw it. I also was very jealous as I'm sitting in my office and I want to go deep <laughs> sea fishing with you too. Big goal for this year is to be on the boat even more. So that's good. Amen. You know? Were there any unexpected shifts or changes uh, going through the program that you just didn't expect to come from it? Um, well, I mean, you you expressed it in the discovery call about how much of a community the program is and how much everybody leans on each other and learns from each other as much as they do from the program itself. Um, but even with it being expressed, I didn't expect, quite frankly, that that is, you know, invaluable the the group coaching calls and you know the community of members involved has been really terrific for us i've learned just as much from the other people in the group as i have from the program itself yeah and that's not in any way to knock the program it's just to say you know especially that we <clears throat> we're in such a rural community where um you know we don't have a lot of you kind of get to a certain point i think as a business owner as an entrepreneur where you wonder, like, am I still learning? Who am I learning from? You know, what area, what, where do I go when, you know, one issue that we had for sure before the program was when there were problems within the walls of our own business, we didn't necessarily, especially after 10 years of being in business for myself, it's, you know, my prior experiences at that point were pretty far off on the horizon. And it wasn't like, you know, I have some friends that I've worked with that I certainly would call um, but you know, you didn't necessarily have like a support group, right? And so right. with the program and we have this two hours every week and then beyond that, you know, there's other channels of communication with the other members. Um, and so, and, you know, certainly with certain, certain members, I really hit it off with, or we now share private emails and phone calls and text messages. And, you know, so, and with everybody in the group is so diverse too, as far as their, you know, the way they are in industry. So if it's a pizza question, I reach out to David, you know, if it's a, right local kind of Eastern shore question, I reach out to Ryan, you know, and yeah. so things of that nature, it's been really, that has been tremendous. I mean, the, the, it's just been a tremendous impact on, um, I can't tell you how many things that we've learned and been like, oh, that's a terrific idea. How come we don't do that? You know, whether it's a bonus point system that people are using in play for accountability, um, equipment issues that have come up and thoughts of, you know, things around that. I think that the people in the group have consistently made us smarter um, and more effective you know, leaders and partners and operators. And that was, you know, even though you expressed that it was a huge part of the a part of the thing, it was not something I anticipated being as 
um, impactful as it's been. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. So I know what I know, but I don't run a restaurant anymore. So I'm not in the day to day understanding of what this equipment works or, you know, whether we should be changing oil this or something else came on the pro on the market. And, uh, and the beautiful part about the group coaching calls is you have somebody in week one and week 30. And so all the way through the group doesn't change personality much little bit depending on people. However, what's consistent is everybody's willing to help each other. And I believe that you can have entrepreneurial friends and talk business and they're going to tell you, well, didn't you ever think about doing this? And you're, you want to go, you don't understand. And with restaurant people, when you've got a group of restaurant people, they understand the absolutely nutsy things that go on in a restaurant, the real challenges you have. And it gives you a sense of, you know, safety and security when you know you've got peers that truly get you and better yet have a solution for you. And, and, and I tell people like you in a discovery call, like, you don't understand people finish the week 30 and they go, Oh, can I stay on the weekly call? And I go, no, <laughs> it's like, they want to stay. And it's like, you're yeah. kidding me for 30 weeks, two hours at a time, you still want to stay in that. And it truly is the group. Well, it's, you know, you got a, you got a bunch of people that are like-minded too, right? It's not like you're necessarily right. talking to restaurant operators who are just kind of, you know, sailing the waters without wondering about how they can maybe make their business better. Everybody has a growth mindset. Everybody's in the program for a reason of trying to, you know, affect change within their operations. So, and they're also just, it's just a very welcoming place that people, you know, want to help you. And I, and I think that we've been able to contribute, you know, for a lot of people in the group too, with whether it's things that, you know, maybe we've seen or had creative solutions to. Absolutely. Um, so that's been huge. I mean, it's been a huge part of the program as much as the systems you know, which don't get me wrong, the systems are critical and, you know, I can't imagine life without them now. Um, but the, but that part of the group has been terrific and was, it was not necessarily, I didn't expect it to be as impactful as it was. Well, speaking of life, what's life like for you today and what do you anticipate for this season going <laughs> into it? What's it going to be like for you? Uh, well, that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I mean, life today for me is, um, I think I'm able to spend a little bit more time on the creative things that inspire me about the business. Um, I'm sure everybody who's been in this business for, you know, a little while reaches certain valleys of appreciation for their business, I guess, in the sense that there's certainly been times where I've wondered, you know, looked at my wife and like, what else can I do? You know, I'm not sure if I want to do this anymore. Um, but these days I'm able to, you know, really kind of take some of the things that, that used to be, um, you know, you're just checking the box every day stuff that you don't enjoy doing that becomes redundant that, you know, it's important to still be consistent, but I'm able to focus more on the parts of the business that, um, you know, I'm enthusiastic about that keep me going every day. And yeah. it's made me, it's given me a better appreciation for the business and I, I don't find myself reaching those valleys as much. So I'm actually, to some degree, I almost sent you an email last week. So I was working like eight o'clock in the morning till about midnight every day. And, you know, while that goes contrary to the whole point of the program, the reason I almost sent you the email was because I was doing it because I wanted to, not because I had to. Right. Yeah. I was all fired up about a possible business venture. I was working on projections for both restaurants. I was reviewing, um, you know, job packages for all salary managers at both places. I'm in the middle of hiring a new chef and, you know, all this stuff. And some of it didn't have to be done that week, but it's all stuff that I get excited about. It's all stuff that, you know, when the family goes to bed at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, I'm like, oh, I'll just sit down on the computer for 15 minutes. And the next thing I know, it's 11 or 12. Right. And it's because it's the things that I'm enthusiastic about coming up with new menu ideas. Um, you know, the stuff that really, you know, I want to shoot you an email and say, hey, thanks. I'm working 14 hours. You said I was going to work less, but I'm working 14 hours because I want to. Right. Because I'm doing, right. I'm not, you know, I'm not in there yelling at somebody about, you know, hey, how come we didn't mop correctly last night? Or how come the line or your meads wasn't set up properly? Or, you know, things of that nature that used to be like the frustrating, like, I don't really want, you know, I'm frustrated with this job. Um, because ultimately being an operator is also having a job. Well, and there's, but, yeah, and there's so life for me, it's a sorry, big difference. Between, it, there's a big difference between working strategically on your business and jumping on the line, right? Th yeah, there's I mean, there's I, the big difference. Right. I enjoy working and I can't ever envision myself in a situation where I would stop working. I just don't, that's just not really my mentality, but I enjoy working on things that, that I'm excited about and that I feel like I can have a positive effect on. Um, as opposed to, you know, some of the day to day babysitting that used to really just make me feel like I need to find a different career where I'm relying strictly on myself. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this, you know, this day and age, my life looks a lot more like, well, you know, I can be a lot more flexible with my time. Um, you know, I'll tell you one major change for me, especially being in such a rural seasonal town. I mean, we are from, you know, really from April 1st through October, we're crazy busy, but this time of year, 
is really slow. And this used to be the time of year where I had a lot of time off. And this year, it's it's totally the opposite, right? I'm working like crazy in January and February to make sure the strategies are in place, the projections are correct, the budgets are right, you know, for this coming season. But the goal is that really by April 1st, all the players are in play, the systems are in play, and I'm out fishing, right? So I'd much rather be it's 42 degrees and overcast and cold today. I'm happy to work 14 hours today, you know, but the minute it hits 68 and sunny, I'd like to be out there, you know, on the boat. So, yeah. um, you know, it's it's a lot different approach to the business these days, but um, it's more enjoyable. And it's given the business a longer, a longer lifespan, quite frankly, because, you know, if something's not sustainable, then you're going to find a way out of it. Uh, I love it. Makes me happy. Maybe not the 14 hours, but I get it. it. Again, at least you're doing something that you're passionate about. It's easy to lose time. That, that's a difference right. between I mean, working. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it didn't have to happen. I was just enjoying it. You know, when you're, when you're doing something that you really enjoy, I mean, it's the, the ancient cliche, right? Like if you're doing something you really love, then it's not really work, right? right. So, right. and I've kind of been in that mindset lately. I'm excited. We're doing some renovations right now at the dining room. I do a lot of that stuff myself, painting and sanding and epoxy and you know, picking out new stools and chairs and designing um, that stuff. I mean, I could do that 22 hours a day because I love it. That's the best part, right? So it's not well, work for me. To, sit to you, there, to you, you know, that's it, the best part. It might not be for somebody else like me. Oh, and that's true. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, but that's the creative, right? There's, there's the left side that's, you know, hey, this is all things firing because I'm excited about it. Exactly. Um, exactly. So. What would what would you tell somebody who's thinking about the program who's been circling, listening to the podcast, watching YouTube, maybe even you know reading my book or maybe see me at a seminar or workshop? What would you tell them? Well, I would tell them that number one, I mean, you know, um, financially it's a commitment, but we had a return on investment in the first year probably four times over. Um, so that was a big, you know, for me, it was a big iffy, right? You hear that number, you're like, oh boy, that's, that's a lot. But you know, if you turn that into four times profit in year one, it's a no brainer. Um, and that may not be the case for everybody that could have to do with revenues and where your cost of goods are now, where your primes are now. Um, but for us, that was the case. I would also say that, um, you know, it's not the right program. If you're not willing to do it yourself and put the time in, you've got to make sure that you are committed to learning. And I think that one of the reasons that you and I click well and get along um, is that I'm not looking for somebody to do something for me. I'm looking to learn from someone else so that I can continue, you know, let's say our days come to an end, but now these things are things that I can do on my own because I've learned them. I don't need somebody coming in, holding my hand on it. I don't need to be babysat about it. Um, it's not something that we would have to hire somebody to, you know, continue um, the consistency of it's, it's, you know, reframing your brain about how you're working it so that you have these systems in place in the future. Um, once the program has come to an end. And so that's that's important for me, but it's also important that people understand, you know, it takes a lot of work. It was a lot of work and yeah. it's a lot of commitment. Um, and especially for us, I mean, we were somewhat crazy to start the program in the middle of April, going into our busiest season with two operations, trying to implement all of this change in the heart of season. Um, so much so, I would also say um, that when you come into the program for us, we were way behind. And, you know, we spent some time way behind because we were taking this on such a, a, a surplus of work while we already were kind of up to our necks going into season. Um, but, you know, the beauty of it is we had real change in year one already. And I would say that we were probably not your best students. Um, you know, I would say that we probably had, you know, I don't know, 65 to 75 percent of it down in in the program. But then right. since the end of the program, once we finished the program, I think it was the last week of September, um, which is coincides with when our season really comes, you know, kind of really falling down the hill a bit. Uh, so we had the opportunity then to really spend the last few months and we're still going back through, you know, week by week and saying, well, what areas did we really grip? What areas have we really, really implemented well? What are we, what is just natural now that we don't even think about? And what areas are we still kind of like, are we really keeping up with the key item tracker or is it just kind of on the wall and it hasn't been filled out for three days? And how do we make sure that before April 1 this year, these things are consistent and they become habit, right? Because it's all about creating new habits that then yep. you can pass on to your management team so that they have habits um, that they, you know, eventually realize these, these things. The other difference, well, I would say the other challenge too, was getting buy-in from your team sometimes, right? That, hey, right. you get a lot of people that have been doing one thing a certain way for a long time, 
And then it's like, yeah, you might be the chef, you might be the GM, and now you're going to change the way you're doing your job. And you get a little bit of, what do you mean? We're doing great. The place is profitable. We're busy. We're on a wait every day. I mean, that was our case. We're on a wait seven days a week from 11 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. So people are looking at me like, what do you mean we have to get better? How do we get better than that? Well, we get better by lowering our primes. We get better by creating new habits. We get better by making ourselves more efficient. We get better by becoming an employer of choice so that we have the cream of the crop working for us so that all these other habits then become habits for them. And all of this stuff comes together. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it's a lot of work. You got to be willing to put in the time. You got to make sure that you're going to be consistent. And um, it's a big financial commitment. But we saw that return year one, you know, far more than we would have. Yeah, it, it truly is. You know, I say it's a premium program. And in those discovery calls, I go, when you're investing, it's not about me anymore. It's about you. Are you going to do the work? If you're not going to do the work, do not sign up. And what right. I also love is you did go in during season. I cannot tell you how many seasonal operations go, well, we're going to wait till after season. Well, right. the same shit's got to happen all the time. And we can make excuses and we can say, well, we'll put it off. It'll be tomorrow. You know, there'll, there'll be another day to start. But there's no better day to start than now. It doesn't mean you aren't going to fall behind. It doesn't mean I'm not willing to extend you and make sure we help you get there. But the truth of the matter is, the moment you make the decision, you, you kind of, you need to take action and say, this is the time. With that said, if you hadn't made the change and we didn't do the menu engineering right out of the gate, you would have left a shit ton of money on the table, even without the other changes. So again, another right. thing, you know, better to, to become more profitable when you're busy than when you're slow. Well, I mean, for instance, for us, you know, we went from a 37% food cost to 31% in the first year with you. And that's six points on a $3 million restaurant that runs at 68% food sales. So, you know, the math is tremendous there and by far paid for the program and then, you know, gave us our most profitable season by far. Um, so, you know, even small changes on just one area of prime costs is tremendous, you know, especially the higher your volume is. So, um, but when you can put all three together in your primes and get your food, beverage and labor dialed in, then you can see, you know, a lot more freedom. And then, you know, the nice thing then is, and as you and I've discussed, once you get those things under control and you understand it, then you have a lot more leeway on how you run your business. In yeah. other words, you know, for us this year, I'm building in $50,000 worth of charitable contributions and still making sure we have an investment team. So I'm still making sure that the partners are happy with the return as far as the net income. Well, we feel like we have the leeway to put $50,000 towards helping the YMCA build a new basketball gym and helping, you know, the local theater put on plays and things like that. And that makes me feel better about going to work every day. That makes me feel like the restaurant has purpose beyond just being a restaurant for the sake of hospitality and, you know, financial benefit for the employees and ourselves. So, and then you have a lot more leeway on, hey, you know, maybe this GM has been with me and really deserves to be making a bit more, have a better bonus structure. Um, but until you get your primes in order, you know, it's difficult to create a budget that makes everybody happy right. if your numbers aren't happy, <laughs> you know? So now that we've got our numbers kind of in order, we, I mean, I'm really proud of the budget for this year. I think that we've been able to, you know, look at the budget because we have the confidence in hitting the prime targets that, that we've achieved and that we're working towards. Um, you know, we have the confidence to say, I mean, I just hired a new chef on Friday. And so putting together a package for him in the past would have looked like me and Mike sitting around saying, well, what do you think he's worth? I don't know. Is he 55, 60? Do we do a bonus structure? You know, blah, blah, blah. Well, now the package is here's your base salary. Here's your quarterly bonus. The quarterly bonuses are based on you achieving this food cost percentage based on this ideal food cost percentage based on this menu engineering based on what we've done historically in the last year because we know what we're doing. Yeah. So it's not a question of guessing. It's you know, this is what I can offer them. I plug it into the budget before I offer them. I look at the bottom line. I say, am I still happy with it? Does it still meet the needs of the other staff members as far as the budget? Does it still meet the charitable donations? Does it still give us a bottom line that makes a diverse group of investors happy? And when all those answers are yes, then it's really easy to put, you're not guessing on paper of what you can offer them, right? So it's it's been a tremendous change. Well, that just summarized- off topic. <laughs> well, no, no, really, because it, it, it sits there and says, okay, the importance of budgeting, creating a proactive plan for success, your plan for success, understanding the numbers, where they come from, what's possible, but more importantly, how important that budget must match your core values. That's what I kept hearing. I'm going, okay, here we are. Everybody can be listening and go, well, we can make more, more, more money, more money, more money, but they don't understand, or maybe they did pick up on giving back charity to the community that you operate in, Get, paying my managers a little bit more, whether salary and or bonus, having that kind of knowledge because you know what you're gonna make 
and you can decide what you want to share versus going backwards looking what how did we do this here oh we we made or lost how'd that happen dumbass luck you decided what you want to do because you know with reasonable predictability where your profitability is going to be. We never hit our budget. There's always an oh shit moment. Who could have predicted COVID? Who could have predicted the labor shortage? Who could have predicted, you know, the, the inflation and so on. But the fact is you just keep changing that budget, modifying your plan, and you stay true to your core values. You still get to, to that place you want to be. It's just the path isn't necessarily straight. That's what excites me about what you just shared. It's it's not just about money. It's about your core values too. And you as an operator, we never try and change you. You just decide how you want to get there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, you're giving people the tools to run the business in the way that maybe they won't always wanted to run it, you know? And I mean, not to elaborate on it, but you know, <clears throat> you look at like the, the game has changed since you and I came up in the last 27 something years, right? It's yeah. no longer the... The expectation isn't 65, 85 hours a week in most places anymore. Now you have conversations about sustainable, you know, jobs and, and living wages and things like that. Not that, and those are the right conversations to be having. And that's the right shift for the industry. Um, as an operator, unfortunately, it was never built into the margins, right. right? So now it's a question of, well, how do I create a sustainable job for somebody to be a high end position that's working 50, 55 hours a week? And my expectation of them isn't 75 hours a week anymore while also having enough money left over to pay the people around them to make up for the 20 hours a week that they used to pull um, and making all those things happen makes you a better business goes back to the core values um, but you know pulling that all together you used to just you know mike and i for years when minimum wage would go up as it has in virginia five dollars over the last four years yeah. um you know if you don't have a budget for that you're just continuously saying well if my guy who was making nine now makes 10 my guy who's making 16 probably has to make 19 or what is you know how do you figure that out well you need you need the tools to figure that out instead of what we used to do was just kind of feel like a, a moral compass i guess on decisions like do we feel like this is the right decision yes let's make it the right decision and then you get your p l and you're like oh maybe it wasn't the right decision <laughs> you know so now you have um, you have a little bit of a navigation system with the budget. Like you said, you're not going to hit it every single time, but, um, you know, you're also seeing it, you know, pretty close to real time to see where you're off so that you can try to affect change quickly and be proactive about what you need to do to, to get back on course. Amen to that. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today and share your story. Um, I, I think you've done incredibly, you know, on your own before working with me and this program, but it's really been gratifying to see the huge leaps you've made in such a short time because you were already growth mindset, already had numbers, you understood budgets, you had recipe cards, like you were lined up to be successful. It was just that little nudge, like you said, understanding that maybe it's not a 34% food cost, just because that's national average isn't where I should be and utilizing the systems to create your targets based on what you need to do. And, and that's really rewarding for as a coach to see that kind of change. It, if there was one last thing you want to share with people before we go, could be a quote, could be a book, could be any piece of advice, what would that be? Well, I, you and I have talked about this a little bit lately. I mean, I'm really trying to find a way, you know, how's life different for me now is that I, I've known this for years. It was a quote from somebody I look up to a long time ago about splitting your life into thirds, you know, one third for yourself, um, one third for your family, one third for, you know, your job or your career. And that's something that I've always kind of wanted to get to as, but it's always been a question of, I just didn't have the time to get to. Um, so now, you know, through the program and through kind of growing a little bit here, I'm, I'm hoping to really, I doubt I'll get there this year. Um, but you know, even just getting back in the basketball court a bit, you know, getting out on the boat a little bit or things that I can do for myself so that I'm present for myself so that when I'm with, you know, the kids and my wife, you know, I'm present with them. And so that when I'm, doing things and focused on work, you know, I'm 100% present there as opposed to, I guess a year ago, um, I would think, you know, at night, okay, tomorrow looks like this and honey, I probably have time to go to lunch with you, right? And then something right. comes up and the call happens and ah, sorry, babe, I can't do lunch today, you know? And, you know, now it's more like, okay, I'm trying to plan out, you know, the week and most of the time I'm sticking to it so that it's, you know, the intention was always right to have the, the balance, right? But um, oftentimes the business was, was dictating what the schedule really was, as opposed to the desire for balance. Right. Um, so now it seems that I've, you know, gotten into enough of a position, um, you know, mentor wise with, with the teams that, you know, hopefully this year is going to be all about trying to find that balance. So I love that. I remember when you shared that with me, I wrote it down twice. 
Um, third, third, third. Uh, if anybody's listening, I think that's a great goal to have. Again, John, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us today. And I, I hope we have a conversation again soon. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Hey, that was an awesome episode. I want to thank you for taking the time to take action on building a better, more prosperous restaurant. Before you go, I want to give you these three thoughts. One, by combining leadership and taking action with systems and training being checked by accountability, you are on your way to creating prosperity for you and your restaurant. Two, I have something I need from you. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. By leaving us a review, other restaurant pros seeking out this information are able to find it. I read the reviews and hearing how this information has benefited you does wonders for me. And three, if you find any of the discussions helpful, share them. The more restaurant pros who have access to them, the better we become as an industry. For more restaurant resources or to get in contact with me, connect with me at davidscottpeters.com. Be passionate about what you're doing. Be persistent, but more importantly, become better and help everyone around you become better. And your restaurant is going to kick some ass. If you're tired of not being able to leave your restaurant because no one else knows how to run it, I want to make sure you know it doesn't have to be that way. You can leave your restaurant. It is possible to build a team of people who know how you want the restaurant to run. With these trained and responsible people in place, you can give yourself time away. What would you do if you had time away from your restaurant? Would you sleep better? Would your relationships improve? Would you feel more relaxed? These are all things you deserve to experience as a business owner. It's why we own our own businesses. If you would like to learn how to own a restaurant that doesn't depend on you to be successful, click the link in the description to watch a free training course that teaches you exactly what you have to do. Also, be sure to subscribe to get my weekly tips and watch these two videos to get more information and guidance for running a successful restaurant.